Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. On Wednesday night, we've been studying parables. Uh, we're going to take a brief uh, pause from that. We're going to go back to that probably at some point. Uh, I'm going to spend this evening talking about a verse in John, John 5.39. It's a very familiar verse to many Christians. It's one of the uh, the most it all, it's always been one of the most intriguing verses uh, to me. Uh, highly relevant uh, New Testament verse. Uh, there's just a whole lot to, to unpack in this verse. It's every now and then I just I kind of like to just take a break from everything that's going on and just maybe talk about something that I find of interest and I find this of great interest. And so we're gonna talk about that. I hope that you uh, gain something from uh, the, the, the text that we're going to be looking at here concerning that verse. I'm going to go ahead and read the verse to, to begin with. It's John chapter 5 verse 39. Uh, I'm reading from the King James Version, So, uh, but if you have any other version, it's, uh, that's fine. You search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Now that doesn't seem like a whole lot of words, but there's a, like I said, I, I think there's a whole lot that can be looked at uh, in this one verse that could help us understand uh, many things. In fact, it can help us understand uh, uh, first and foremost uh, the context of, uh, of the verse, and what's going on, why that Jesus uh, said the words that he did. Uh, those of you who have the King James Version, you'll see this is this is in the uh, it's the part of the red letter edition of, of the words that Jesus spoke. So these words came from our Lord himself. Uh, search the scriptures uh, or better, ye search the scriptures. And uh, I want you to take a note that all the parallel verbs in the context are in the indicative mood, uh, uh, the mood of, of certainty. Uh, ye have uh, neither heard nor have seen, uh, verse 37. Ye have not his word, ye believe not. Uh, that's uh, in John 5:38. Uh, ye think that uh, ye have, John 5.39, ye will not, and ye might have, that's in John 5.40. So, there is a sort of an order of thought uh, that's, as you, as you read through this context, uh, number one, God has in the Old Testament witnessed of me, uh, but ye with uh, unreceptive hearts have never heard a voice nor seen a shape of God, an image of God. That's John 5, 37. Uh, you have not his word dwelling in you or it would have witnessed of me. Yeah, instead of receiving the scriptures as a living power within you, you search and you explain the letter of them from without. Uh, you think that they contain eternal life and, and that which explains your reverence for them. Uh, they really are witnesses of me and yet you seeking in them eternal life. You're not willing to come to me that you may have this life. And I, so I believe that's the most natural interpretation of the words. But I believe that it helps to understand the spirit in which the rabbis treated their scriptures. The fact of the searching and not finding uh, is really a matter of wonder. Now, most of you who follow this channel, you know where I stand on the absolute supreme sovereignty of God. God, uh, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that uh, we are His family. Uh, God begat a family. Uh, the reason why he uses the, the, term, the phrase new birth is because we're born of God. 
born again, or as I prefer, born from above. Uh, it was we had no choice in the matter, contrary to what pop, popular uh, belief states. Uh, we uh, were simply born again. We had we played no no role. We had no role. We played no part in our new birth, which is basically, I believe, the primary reason why God chose the illustration of birth, because no one births themselves. And, and God has his people. Uh, he sowed his seed. Satan sowed his. There's sheep and goats and wheat and tare. We are his family. We're members of the household of God. Uh, he, uh, he predetermined that, and, and we know that from Acts, that, uh, that, that you know, our Lord Jesus Christ would be rejected and crucified, condemned and crucified, uh, that uh, it was by their wicked hands they took and slayed him, but God uh, uh, not only foreknew this, but he predetermined it, and that's what we read in Acts. So I guess the if we were to ask the question, you know, how could these Jews, particularly these rabbis, these ones who are really learned and educated in the Old Testament scriptures, how could they uh, miss seeing Christ in searching through the scriptures? It's really not as much miss, uh, as they missed seeing Christ, uh, but that they wouldn't, he says that they wouldn't come unto him that they may have life. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there's no doubt in my mind that many of the Jews uh, understood that, that uh, as they studied through the Old Testament scriptures, they, they recognized the Messiah when he came. Uh, these religious leaders of Jesus' day, uh, for the most part, did not. Uh, and an argument, I'm sure, that an argument could rightly be made uh, uh, in defense of, of, of the fact that God chose those who would hear. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit, for they're spiritually discerned. And so they were spiritually blinded, and this was all God's intention. It was so that salvation would come to the Gentiles. And we can go on and on and on about God's sovereign control over all of this and how that he knew those were his. I'm still going to ask the question, though, despite my belief in absolute rock-solid belief in God's sovereignty, I still would like to, to pose the question here that, that from a practical standpoint, why did they refuse to come to him in order that they may have life? Now, I guess you could argue that that uh, there were those who just outright knew from the study of the scriptures that he was the Messiah and refused to come to him that they might have life. You could also argue that there were others who, who failed to see him in the scriptures and so therefore they could not come unto him that they may have life because they didn't perceive him as being the true Messiah. But the question, folks, has always intrigued me and so I believe it, it helps to, it's going to help us to, to understand the spirit in which the rabbis actually treated the Word of God, which I think is re very relevant and is probably just, for the most part, that's probably the, the direction in which this, this video is going to go. And hopefully there'll be some present day application at the end of it. Uh, Acts teaches us that God determined Christ would be rejected, but how, practically speaking, did they miss seeing him? Or better put, how did, why is it, how is it that they would not come to them, to him in order that they may have life? Well, as early as the book of Chronicles, uh, it's not a book that most Christians spend a lot of time in, uh, we find mention of the the Midrashim, or uh, uh, I want to put that word up here on the screen here. It's, it's, it's going to stay with us for the rest of this video. Uh, it's, uh, you could call it commentaries. 
uh, that's in the sense in which this word is used. Uh, for example, Caesar's commentaries. There were there were actually uh, there were actually commentaries by Caesar. Uh, the the Midrashim, folks, is an ancient commentary on part of the Hebrew scriptures attached to the biblical text. The earliest Midrashim come from the second century AD. Uh, although much of their content is older, they were basically. Uh, placing too much emphasis on their own commentaries. Uh, at least they knew them, I think they knew them better than they actually did the scriptures, which is, and, and I'm going to offer a suggestion as to why I think that's that, that's true. Uh, uh, but in a nutshell, the voices of men, the opinions of men, uh, superseded the Word of God. The uh, there's a what, what's called the family book of Midrash, and it, it contains 52 Jewish uh, stories. Uh, I put that in quotes. It's, these are stories from the sages. The the Jewish tradition repeatedly affirms the immutable sanctity of the Torah's words, but it also treats the Torah as an unbound book to which each generation adds to it. The stories that the, that the Torah generates, the 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 uh, the rabbis, their comp, their conversations, the, the conversations that those stories elicit, these form the basis of midrash, which is created anew with each transmission. Second uh, Chronicles uh, thirteen twenty two. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter thirteen verses verse twenty two. The uh, the rest of the acts of, of Abijah are written in the midrash of the prophet Ido. Uh, the uh, the history of Joash is written in the midrash of the Book of Kings. Uh, that's in the twenty fourth chapter of Second Chronicles. It is. But that is not an exposition of the plain meaning of the Hebrew text. Those of you who have followed this channel know just how much I'm always constantly re pushing this, the importance, talking about how important it is, uh, or the distinction between the actual text and things that are written about the text. Or man's opinion, man's logic. It's you, I don't know how many times you heard me say, you know, that God is the author. Uh, Paul merely held the pen, or the human authors merely held the pen. Uh, we're not looking at when we're studying through, say, Corinthians, like we're doing on Sunday. Uh, we're not looking at Paul's reasoning, Paul's logic, Paul's uh, ideas. Uh, it's that's that's take note of of that, that we're not looking at Paul's ideas, okay? Uh, we're not looking at John's ideas. Uh, you know, here as we're looking at this in John, and that's an important point in all this. If, if, if you take note of that, you, you'll, you'll understand maybe perhaps where I'm going with this. Uh, the art and the practice of, of creating midrash is not aimed merely at textual analysis. It's a body of literature. It's conjured up by human authors. That's what it is. Now, this would be the context in which, if you wanted to look at this in historical context, this is this is where we're at in uh, in this verse in John. This is the scene. You might say this is the setting, it's the, uh, the atmosphere in which uh, uh, was surrounded uh, those who heard our Lord speak these words. Because it's important to note that uh, these midrashim, they sprang up after the captivity. That's, a, that's also an important part to understand this. 
they, they, they came about after the captivity when the people had lost the older language of the law and the prophets and, 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 and what happened was now you've got paraphrases and expositions and homilies and all of that it became necessary but unfortunately what happened was it grew into a vast intricate system of secrets and precepts and and fences, fence laws, and, and superstitions, and traditions of elders, and, and stuff, all of that because of their captivity. Uh, Matthew, the 15th chapter of Matthew, the 7th chapter of Mark, uh, relate, uh, refers to these, the, the traditions of elders. And this gave, this gave, this made a, a it gave abundant room uh, for the pride of men, but it nullified the Word of God, making it of no effect. Uh, again, Matthew chapter 15, Mark chapter 7. Why did Israel end up in captivity? Uh, more than once. Well, throughout the Hebrew Bible, the prophets argue that the exile happened because the people failed to follow God's instructions. You know, just like the Israelite slavery in Egypt, you know, your Charleston Heston movie, you know, the Ten Commandments, you know, the, uh, the the Babylonian captivity had a number of serious effects on Judaism and Jewish culture. It really affected the culture. Uh, and what's important is both were followed by deliverance. But interestingly, the period of the arrangement of this, this midrash of the law, it commenced the half century before the ministry of Christ. Before Christ comes on the scene, it had already begun. And of course, our Lord would have known that. Uh, uh, Halil the first, the, the first, Halil the first, he succeeded to the presidency, uh, the presidency of the Sanhedrin uh, in uh, uh, 30 B.C. And uh, Akiba, who was his, his successor in this in compiling the Mishnah, he was a boy when these words right here in John were spoken by our Lord. And so the present day application of this is nothing short of astounding, folks. Christianity today is little different uh, when it comes to its searching the scriptures as a result of its own uh, man-made paraphrases, expositions, homilies, trite cliches, and, and untrue sayings, it, it, it has also grown into a vast and intricate system with with its own set of erroneous ideas and, and interpretations, with its own secrets and its own precepts and, and fences and, and its own traditions of elders. People are much more interested in what others have to say about a verse than them studying the verse themselves. It's something I've cautioned my viewers against repeatedly to not believe something just because I believe it to examine these things, to see whether they be so, you know, be the be the noble Berean, examine these scriptures daily to see if these things be so. Not just believe it just because I believe it. Years ago, I was uh, ministering to one of my art students, and this was a long time ago, and uh, I had mentioned something. We got into a discussion about the Bible, and we were talking about something. I can't remember exactly what it was, uh, she says, well, that sounds really interesting, but I need, to, I, I need to ask my pastor about this. 
And no, she didn't need to ask her pastor what she needed to do. She needed to look and see, be the noble brand and look and see if, if what I was saying was the truth. See if, if the text, see what the text was saying. It's not as much as they're, you know, that you folks need to look to see if what I'm saying is the truth. Oh, well, that's true. It's what you really need to do is look at the text to see whether or not these things are true. There's been a, a whole lot of writings and articles down through the generations over the centuries. There's been a, a ton of literature written on the scriptures and that really has come today. It has come to take really supersede in, in importance the actual text of the Word of God, which is a little different than what we see which was going on in John 5.39. Uh, you search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have life. Now, uh, the question could, right, could fairly be asked, well, these people that Jesus is speaking to, uh, some would, would obviously, some may have, they may have been his people. Uh, some that heard this may have not been his people. And so when he says that they're unwilling to come to him that they may have life, uh, I think that we, we need to be very careful in distinguishing between uh, or at least, at least being honest enough to look at the possibilities of who he's was, who was, who he was speaking to, who may have been hearing his voice. What we know from other scripture, which we can bring in alongside this to help us understand it, is that there were those who were his who had ears to hear. There were those who were not his who did not have ears to hear. They could not have come to him to have life. The the the, the question. One of the questions that we should ask should be, well, is he talking about redemption? Uh, that is, you know, being born again, uh, redeemed. Uh, are we looking at a, a, a passage that's talking about his people who are redeemed not coming to him to have life, that they might have life? Or those who are not redeemed who, who are not coming to him to be redeemed uh, to have life? And... And of course, the word zoe in the Greek for life, the word means a quality of life. Uh, Christ came to give us life and life more abundantly. The emphasis when we talk about life or eternal life is on the quality of the life. Uh, in fact, everyone is going to have eternal life. It's just a matter of where they spend it. Uh, now, you, you could rightly also argue that the lost, the condemned, you know, that go into the lake of fire, you know, they're, they're, it's the second death, they're spiritually dead, but they are very much conscious of what's going on. Uh, they're not dead in the sense that, that, that they don't know what's going on. They are alive, and they are going to be alive forever. Everyone is going to spend eternity someplace. Uh, these individuals... I believe he's primarily talking to those who are his. That they searched the scriptures diligently. The word there means to really frantically search. You're, you're really, really searching the scriptures because you think that in them there's life. And of course, it's I think it's we're oversimplifying it just a bit when we. Uh, when we, when we suggest that, well, what that's saying is these, you know, here we are, we're searching the scriptures uh, because uh, in them, we think that in these scriptures, there's, there's life. And so we're, we're, we're basically frantically going through the scriptures looking for some confirmation that we have life or looking for something that we must do in order to have life. And I'm talking about in the redemptive sense. In order to make it to heaven, we've got to figure out, you know, go through, what is it I got to do? What is it I got to do? And of course, uh, 
And now we have to bring the law into this discussion because Israel was given the law. They searched the scriptures. Uh, they knew them. They knew the scriptures, the, the rabbis uh, of Jesus' day. They knew the scriptures better than you and I could ever know the scriptures. And yet they refused to come to him that they may have life. Why? I mean, why did they do that? So the question of the day could be, well, you know, how could the most learned Jews familiar with the scriptures, how could they miss seeing Christ in these scriptures? Uh, it's true that they were blinded judicially, but practically speaking, what caused not as much the blindness, what caused them to not come to Christ in order that they may have life? They, did they not believe that he was the Messiah? Uh, were there those there who actually believed that he was the Messiah, yet refused to come to him that they might have life? It's, it's a, we could spend all day in this passage I think that we're looking at symptoms, not the, the real cause of the disease here. Something caused them to not believe that he was the Messiah. You know, so, okay, so what caused that? What really caused that? You know, I'm, I'm in absolute 100% agreement with God being sovereign. You know, I'm, I'm, what I'm asking is, what was the practical reason for them not coming to him that they might have life? You know, what caused them to not see him as their Messiah from a practical standpoint? You know, not, they're not blamed for not searching. That there's no blame here in, in, the, in the verse. Jesus is not. He hasn't indicated that there's any blame that's that's due them for for not searching. They're searching. In fact, they're searching diligently you know, through the Scriptures. We go over to the 12th chapter of John. We see that, that the prophet Isaiah prophesied that they would not uh, believe the good news. They could not because their eyes were blinded, their hearts were hardened, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. I cannot argue with that at all. God is indeed sovereign. He can do what he wills with each and every one of us. I believe that we can do both. I believe that we can look at the ab abject sovereignty of God, the absolute sovereignty of God in this matter. And, uh, and understand uh, the idea of, of unconditional election, total depravity, unconditional election, uh, irresistible grace, and so on and so forth. But I see nothing at all wrong with trying to look at this from a practical standpoint. It's true, God will do what He wants with us. But there's always, on the practical side, there's always a practical reason why that men do what they do. Uh, I think if we just simply looked at this as if none of these were his people, so none of them are going to come to him that they might have life. I think that's wrong. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we can uh, be his we can be heaven bound. We can be uh, one of those for whom Christ died. We can be a member of his family, of the, of the family and the household of God. And we can be searching diligently through the scriptures. And uh, because we think that in them that there is life, but be, and yet be unwilling to come to him in order that we may have that quality of life that we see in that word zoe. You know, no, notice it doesn't say eternal life. It just says life. That's life in general. Life here and now. You, you know, you, 
each one of us is experiencing a quality of life. Uh, that quality of life from a Christian, if, if we keep it in a Christian context, there's a quality of life that us Christians experience or that we don't experience. And I think the same was true of the Jews. Now, if you really wanted to keep this simple, which I, I have most of the, minute, the number of years I've been a Christian, it, it's not hard, it's not really all that difficult to understand that, that most people are looking in this book to try to find something that they can do to, to earn merit before God something that they feel that they must seek out and find and do in order to appease an angry God, to gain his favor, that if they just dot all their, their I's and cross all their T's, if they, if they do something right, that they'll somehow make it. And, and I think that you see that within the, the spirit of that verse. But I can't underestimate the danger, folks, of caring more about man's opinion, let's say, for what he's written about something or his commentary about something than the actual text itself. The only strength, the only power, the only real force in the words that of Scripture, I mean, it, it is the Holy Spirit is our one teacher. I do not believe that the Holy Spirit will teach you doctrine through by, by any other means except through this book. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of commentaries? No. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of my pastor? No. Faith comes by, by hearing and hearing the word of truth. Uh, now, if, if, if you wanted to take this whole subject off into an area of eschatology, uh, that's not very, doesn't seem very difficult for me to do that because there is, this is not, this is something, we're looking at something that took place back then how that the Jews, the rabbis, were handling the, the Word of God, how that they missed seeing Christ or they didn't come to Christ because they thought that in the, in the Scriptures themselves, that the Scriptures themselves contained life and they were unwilling to come unto Him that they may have life. And we can see how that that is basically being repeated in our own, in, during this present dispensation of grace that we've been in for nearly 2,000 years. But even more so today, in the modern day in which uh, our present modern day in which we are awaiting our Lord's return we're seeing the exact same thing happen today that happened back then there's nothing new under the Sun okay uh, history does repeat itself we're seeing the church do the same thing that the Jews the rabbis were doing then uh, I don't know how many pastors I've known that'll pull a canned sermon off the shelf and that sermon wasn't even written by them. Or, their, or at the very least, what they do is they, they hear other people's opinions. They go, well, I like that one. I don't like that one. I like that one. I don't like that one. And they, they make a list of the ones that they, the ideas that they like, and, and at least mentally, you know, and those that they don't, they throw out. They reject the ideas that they don't like. And from that, they build a theology. A worldview, a Christian worldview. Their Christian worldview is built upon, well, this, 
a little bit about what how what my grandpa believed and a little bit about what my pastor believed and 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 I've got to include a little bit about what my wife believes because if I don't agree with her I'm really in trouble and and so you know you go down the list and and, and eventually with all the books you've read and all the articles you've read and all the sermons that you've listened to oh you're uh, you're you're in church on Sunday morning you're listening to a sermon and you kind of like what the preacher's saying and you go you're like I, yeah I, I'll, I'll go with that Sounds good to me. And it becomes one of those building blocks in your overall theology that's going to take you one place or another. It's going gonna, it's gonna to provide that quality of life that Jesus came to give us more abundantly, or it is not. I hope that by in some way I've shed some, at least a little bit of light on this. And... Uh, I don't think it, it hurts us to remind ourselves from time to time just how important this book is, how precious that it is, and how that we need to spend time in it. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.